Great. Uh, thanks again, Anya. Um, I wonder what I'll do next Wednesday when this isn't happening. I wonder why sitting here in my kitchen looking at my screen. Um, no, it's been really enjoyable to to do these the the, the series this month and um, just to thank people for the, the lovely feedback they've been giving and um, it's, it's look it's it's really helpful for me to 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 know that people are listening and that the the, the talks that we're giving are helpful. But the to, this evening one is challenging because we're talking about the social savvy of childhood and I think there's a lot in this because most parents want uh, their child to be assertive and you know uh, strong-willed but not aggressive or brutish and they want their child to have a kind of a social responsibility and a sense of sensitivity but not to be a walkover and so trying to coach your child into some degree of uh, middle ground in terms of that is really challenging but for me the best way in which you can start to understand that is to try and understand the role of childhood and and see the world through their eyes and I think Oftentimes when it comes to friendships, and probably in the, the many years that I'm doing this job, children experience parents as perhaps um, being a little bit dismissive of the challenges of friendships. Because when we become adults, we soon forget the, the importance of friendships growing up and the importance of social relationships and the importance of social savvy. And again, uh, we you know, children want to be popular children. They don't want to be popular adults. And so when we try and sell our idea of what they should be doing uh, it can sometimes obviously uh, fall on deaf ears but so to try and best prepare you to kind of understand this is to try and best understand the challenge of friendship and the world of friendships is rife with politics memberships rules and stipulations and so from very early on we see the complexities of friendships and currencies in, and how it's valued so for early childhood in primary school the friendships are oftentimes territorial so you'll oftentimes have to have this kind of best friend and it's you can only be my friend and you can't be friends with other people and that comes that best friend role comes with a commitment and an ownership um, and oftentimes what we'll experience in this is kind of a dominant passive combination where there's one perhaps what we've described as maybe a bossy child and then another other child is kind of following through so these are not unusual but where, where this is important is to understand that in childhood, in certainly the latency age child, which is up to about nine or 10 or 11, the world is very black and white. And so everything is, it has to be clear. And so everything is cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians, goodies and baddies. And developmentally, that's as much as they can, can process. They don't really do gray all that well. It's in adolescence where the grayness comes in and that's where things t tend to get more complex. But in terms of, of childhood, what I would say is, and this is one thing I've learned, is three is not the magic number when it comes to friendships. And it's important to say this, that the, the best friend dynamic in, in a configuration of three oftentimes has difficulties because oftentimes in a, in a combination of three, exclusivity is often vied for, and this can cause friction. And in many ways, um, as parents will say, you can take one friend to the cinema or you can take one friend for a sleepover and there's always the one who gets left out and that can sometimes oscillate it's not always the same person um but I, genuinely and I, it's just an opening tip i think twos fours etc tend to work a little bit better um but as children get older the group becomes much more important and so children move towards secondary school the friendship evolves into a group mentality the group has a series of unspoken rules in order to achieve and maintain membership in the group. And oftentimes there's a dictatorship. So there's one dominant view and children learn very quick to kind of to not challenge the authority. And that's not terribly helpful from the point of view of developing their 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 own assertiveness. But in terms of their savvy, it tends to, you know, if they they kind of go along with things, they will they'll join what's called the narrow normative. And in terms of and I would say this is a, an evolution over the last number of years. There's far less subgroups of children. It's really weird because in a, in a time where we were never more inclusive and diverse and thinking about, there's far less subgroups of children in terms of, and mostly you'd see this in secondary school, but from the point of view of the kind of rock music children, the sporty children, the the jockey children, the popular children, there's kind of subsections in, and, and we've talked about this, about tribes. There seems to be very little of that. There seems to be a very large normative and then the bell curve of, of others on either side. And I, I've noticed that I think there is a fear in children to paint outside the lines. There is a, and it's weird because we've never had more choice, but we've never had a more narrow. And I, I remember when I was getting my, 
my doctor, my mum came with me and, and she were sitting there and we were watching all these people getting their undergraduate degrees. And mum made a comment. She said, all those girls look exactly the same. And she was right. There was this kind of look that people had. And I think in terms of that narrow normative has meant that I think perhaps children's cultures are a little bit less inclusive. And so children tend to not want to embrace their own authenticity because being on the outside or colouring outside the line sometimes isn't expected. But what we're also noticing is childhood is shrinking. And what, by that, I mean, we're seeing issues in much younger children than traditionally we would have done before. So in terms of, say, the onset of something like an eating disorder or anorexia, that would usually see in secondary school around second year, you'd kind of see the youngest of, of young people suffering with that. In the last five or ten years, you're seeing a lot more children in fifth and sixth class developing eating disorder or disordered eating. And it's this kind of sense of being body conscious, which really they're not able for and certainly not able to to manage. But perhaps it's down to the overexposure of uh, material and um, content that focuses on that. And, and again, body image becomes hugely important. And again, children are visual, so they will pick on someone with glasses red hair, who's a little bit heavier, a little bit thin, a little bit short, a little bit tall. So they'll usually go with those visuals and they'll be the, the kind of target. Um, and it's kind of, again, that the kind of name calling issue is kind of emerging towards the end of primary school. The difference is, is there's a very different kind of, I suppose, established between bullying and banter. And this is one of the things we need to really ma manage because the word bullying is kind of thrown around quite a lot. And I'm not so sure it necessarily refers to that. Um, the, the definition of bullying is when you continue to hurt somebody within the knowledge that what you're doing is hurting them. So if someone is saying something or calling somebody a name and you say, please don't call him that name, it hurts him, and you continue to do it intentionally, there's clearly a, a per, that's a child who's bullying, who knows what they're doing is hurting someone else. For some reason, there's a, a kind of, there's another thing called banter where children just engage in kind of, um, I suppose, vocal horseplay in some respects and give each other nicknames and things like that, which wouldn't necessarily, the, the child who maybe is doing that doesn't have an awareness that this is hurting the other child. And so without that awareness, it's just a case of maybe a kind of a social faux pas that they're not really clued in and they may just be making social mistakes. But what, what I've talked about before, and I think is really important in terms of developing a child's self savvy and, and the savvy of, we see relationships through our relationship with ourselves. And again, I'm getting back to this point about the difference between self-worth and self-confidence. And again, the difference is, is confidence, again, is that projecting how we project ourselves outwardly and our self-worth is our evaluation of ourselves. And we've become a culture that is very much focused on developing confidence and not a lot of developing self-worth. And it's really important that we kind of pay attention to that. And I would describe that as kind of the, the kind of tinderization of society where everything is, you have to have a profile picture, you have to have a funny comment, you have to have something that hooks people in. So the focus becomes really tight on our performance and we've become a very performative society. And children are naturally performative, but there's a sense that what is behind the performance is not important. And if you don't have the performance, you never get to the, the behind the scenes stuff. And that behind the scenes stuff is really what we should be, they're the value systems we need to be showing children, which is things like generosity, loyalty, meaningless, meaningfulness, thoughtfulness, kindness. These are, are qualities that we need to, but rather than get hooked on the external variables about who's the fastest runner, who's the tallest, who's the smallest, we need to get children to see a much more deeper and nourishing value system. And if they can see that in themselves, they automatically will be more resilient and more able to kind of manage social situations. As parents play a far bigger role in friendships than ever before. And I, I'm, I have a, an, an, an undecided about the play date culture. And I, I think from the point of view of, yes, it's helpful to kind of scaffold children who may have difficulties being able to mix together. But I wonder, does it disable our ability for children to engage of their own accord? And again, the play date thing, maybe it should be reserved for the younger child and then the older child should be able to kind of develop those links themselves and be able to create that for themselves. And again, as parents, we have to be very conscious of the value system. And again, building a resilient and savvy child is an internal thing, not an external thing. So it's not about how fast they run or how able they are. It's about their belief in self-worth, self-value and self-esteem. 
And again, as parents, we need to be very careful not to over concentrate on the external variables. And sometimes we do because the child who comes off the field, the first question we ask them is, did you win and did you score? Which again is about, you know, us asking them about their performance rather than asking them, did they enjoy it? And there are different children. Children are some, some children are egocentric, so they will want the medals and the prizes and all that sort of stuff. Other children are not. And it's not that they should be disenfranchised for not being that. It's about rewarding them. And again, I would have issues around how perhaps our sporting structure is set up. I think we're introducing children into sport far earlier than we would have done before. So we have kind of under sixes, under sevens and under eights. And what happens is if we over pay attention to the elite performing child, the other child gets bored. And sometimes from the point of view, we're not valuing participation uh, as much as we are valuing performance. And again, then we're selling a model that this is important and that is not. And I'm seeing cases of children who are retiring from sport at eight years of age because they feel they're not good enough. And again, I think that's down to culture. And I think that's down to how we need to address that. And it's, I'm not saying that everyone should win a prize and everyone there, there should be no kind of competition, but there should be a space for children who are not competitive to still engage. And I think there isn't that. And I would say, Oftentimes when you get to teenage years, and I've seen lots of teenagers who say, there's nowhere we can go to play and do anything active. Because once you get to 13, everything's about medals and prizes and championships and, and it's taken too seriously. And from the point of view of that removes children from a potentially social uh, arena where they could actually engage in a kind of a less supervised way and perhaps able to find their tribes a little bit differently. What I would say is that the issue of exclusion is really important and where children get excluded from friendships and relationships in, in primary school it's incredibly arbitrary. The reason why you get excluded does not necessarily, it's not as a, a result of something you've done, it can be completely innocuous. Um, it can somebody just takes a notion but what happens is the child gets betrayed and let down so they feel that it's something they did. So they often say, what is it about me? And then the next friendship they go into, they enter into the next friendship with a kind of, I'm just happy to be here approach. So they don't want to upset the apple cart. They don't want to uh, kind of undermine the group. And so they park their own value systems and desires and everything, and they've become overly pliable. When they're in that position, other children will take advantage of them because they'll say, well, Coleman doesn't mind. We won't ask Coleman because Coleman won't cause a fuss. Coleman doesn't have. And that that kind of reinforces the, the feelings of exclusion. And therefore, that child feels more condemned that it's something to do with them. And they, they develop a kind of what's called a, a willingness to absorb maltreatment. And I've seen children who, and again, in primary school kids who said, look, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm David's best friend on Wednesday and David's the popular kid in the school and he has a timetable that I'm your best friend Monday, you're Tuesday. And, I'm not, and I was kind of saying to this child, that's not really that very healthy, is it? And he was saying, well, at least I got a day. Do you know, he didn't mind that, that, that issue. And that kind of acceptance of maltreatment is some of, some of that's kind of developmental, but other pieces is that we don't want that to continue into when the child gets a little bit older. And we need them to be able to develop their own savvy relationship, which is about the clear value system on what it means to be a good person, uh, not over, uh, over emphasizing the external variables and nurturing their own self-worth. They need to be, uh, again, aware of the, the need to, to, to conform, if I want to use that word, but also that need to be authentic. And the issue here is that the child needs to feel that their self-belief and self-value is authentic. And that's about, it's not about us telling our children our spe they're special all the time, because that's not necessarily true, because by virtue of the facts that of the word special, everyone can't be special. But from the point of view of, we, we don't want to set children up for a naivety. And sometimes where we over scaffold children, we see that in secondary school, that over scaffolding comes home to roost because the child is not able to self-organize or not able to kind of manage the kind of geographical challenges of secondary school. And so there is a process of where, whereby we have to wean our involvement off and allow children to become independent. And that's largely a very kind of paced and it's carefully thought out thing. At what point do I allow my child to do this and allow my child to do that? We're at the point where you don't want to overwhelm them with responsibility, but you also don't want to kind of disable them by overdoing. And again, that's 
really, really difficult. Where the child does develop that kind of sense of I'm only I'm, I'm happy to be here and has that low self-worth and has gone through a few friendships and relationships where they have been betrayed or let down, that does have an impact for sure. But the, the, the management of that is kind of counterintuitive. The child has to go into the next friendship with a belief that I come with some value. I can add something to this relationship. I, I'm funny, I'm clever, I'm kind, I have these skill sets and almost you're lucky to have me. And again, that sounds like an arrogance, but it's not. It's about a belief, self-worth and self-value. That's where it should be. And again, the issues around trying to get that right. And, and there's a very kind of keen difference between fitting in and belonging. And some children are very good at fitting in where they find the space and they just enact the role that is acceptable to the group, but they're not feeling authentic. They don't feel real. And again, I, I quote lots of children in the last, or teenagers who I've seen who said, you know, I've spent my whole life being who other people wanted me to be, and I forgot to be myself. And again, that knowledge of themselves and their qualities and values, that's the cornerstone for developing resilience. It isn't about adversity and toughness. It's about a relationship with yourself that places a value that is proportionate to what you believe you are. Um, and I, I think there's a metaphor for kind of self-worth, which I'm going to read to you, if, if you don't mind. It's, uh, and it, it's something I would use quite a bit in therapy with young people, that we see ourselves through the eyes of the other. So we've all, we all allow the crowd to define us a little bit in terms of, and I can remember when my mother used to buy me a pair of runners or something, I wouldn't say to her, thank you very much, I like them, until I wore them into school on Monday. And if the lads went, oh, nice runners, then I went, ah, oh, ma'am, thanks very much, because I, I don't know whether I should like them or not. And so we do see ourselves through the eyes of the other. But when we overdo that, there's a problem. And what I'd say to young people is, your opinion of yourself comes from other people and how they treat you. But imagine yourself as a blank canvas. When you hear negative comments, if you take them to heart and start to believe them, you're letting others splash paint on your canvas. They can make of you what they like. Your sense of who you are is defined by other people and their arrogance wins over your confidence and it leaves you confused and doubting and kind of can feel you feeling let low in yourself. When you're allowing them to tell you who you are, you have no control over your own choices. Truly, your canvas is not blank. You are covered in complex painted images accumulated through your life, through your experiences, your family, etc. And you're complex in your own unique way. The only one who holds the paintbrush is you. And because your self-worth drives that painting, that will just, that will decide how you paint yourself. The only person who's living your life, the only one who has the right to decide who you are is you. And people may make the mistake of the blank canvas, but that simply isn't true. You're complete a painting already. All paintings are invite interpretation, and that's as far as others can go. They can interpret you, but they cannot change who you are. Art critics are not painters. Some people enjoy portraits, some po enjoy natural scenes. And just because someone doesn't understand or appreciate your personality, they don't change you. They don't need to change you. You are no less valuable because somebody doesn't like you. And I would always say some people hate Picasso's paintings, but he's still one of the greatest artists in history. His work speaks for itself. So what on your canvas? What do you believe in? What do you stand for? And what are your values in your life? Nobody can change those things. Frame your painting, study it and own it because it's a one of a kind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Coleman. Um... That, that, that's great. I've got a, a whole rake of questions here, so I'll get straight into them. Um, so just f first of all, then, um, any advice for a parent whose child has been accused of bullying? We never get any advice or help and we need it too. We are also trying to parent, trying to improve his empathy. He denied any wrongdoing and said the other child was overreacting. It has impacted our own relationship a lot and the trust I have in him. Yeah, and again, uh, if, if we know there's uh, there's a huge incidence of bullying, then we need to assume that there are a large number of children who engage in bullying, who are the perpetrators. Um, but and um, oftentimes parents are very reluctant to acknowledge that their own child might be the perpetrator of bullying and would often say, not my child. Uh, what I'm saying is, if you're even asking this question, that's first a great step because you're acknowledging that there's something needs to happen here rather than dismissing it as, the other child's being histrionic or the other child is overreacting. 
what this child is doing is they're compensating around power. So from the point of view of where we don't feel we are enough, we oftentimes feel we need to impose our enoughness on other people. And that comes from a position of low self-worth and self-esteem. So when we take a child who's bullying and give them a hard time, and and right, we need to we need to let them know that that behavior is not acceptable and that they need to respect other people's feelings and they need to build on their empathy. But it also is about trying to find something in the child that is good and catch them being good and try and nurture the the kindness in them and trying to nurture the the ability that they have because every child has the capacity to be helpful, be thoughtful, etc. And it's about trying to really nourish those moments and saying that's the type of person that people wants to, want to see rather than the kind of commanding, uh, maybe brutish or enforcing child. And oftentimes the issue being that that, that competitiveness is oftentimes fueled by a crowd. And I would always say in terms of any bullying policy that schools draw up, the power is in the bystander. And I really, there's three three dynamics in a bullying situation, the bully, the bullied, and the bystander. And the bystander is a hugely important part. So if, if you can get a culture within the school that doesn't encourage the bullying behavior, doesn't feed the bullying behavior. So when the, like, again, the online bullying is a perfect example of that. If I make a nasty comment and I get loads of likes for the nasty comment, that fuels me to keep going. Whereas if I made a nasty comment and a tumbleweed, then the, 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 the energy is taken out of it. And his social kudos may be get given from his, his quickness or his, his ability to be um, a little bit mean or a little bit mean spirited. There may be a crew of people who are kind of fueling that. And it is important to, to, that he doesn't see the value in that, but sees the value in the good sides of himself. Um, and it seems quite con counterintuitive. We, we want to punish, we want to sanction, we want to discipline. And of course, you have to do that around the behavior and say, this is not acceptable and there will be sanctions for that. But we also need to nourish that child's sense of self-worth because as much as the child who is the victim of bullying has a self-worth issue, in many cases, if, if not all the cases, when you pick apart a child who is a perpetrator of bullying, there is a self-worth and self-value issue in them as well. So it's again, tricky conversation, but it's about getting that balance between this behavior is not good, but I want to see more of the behaviors that I do. And, and again, we're very and slow and I, myself included to catch our children being good. It is the way in which we enforce better behavior. And again, I would say to you, know, there's very rarely when we go hard on someone and shouting and roaring that they turn around to us and say, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I'm going to change my life because of that. But despite the fact that it doesn't work, we continue to do it. Um, so a, a kind of a longer term project, nurturing his self-worth, self-belief and self-esteem and try and get him to see that it's better value being a good person than it is at the moment. Because it, at the moment it's paying off probably more to be meaner uh, and against, uh, within his group, if that makes sense. Uh, sorry, that's a long answer on you, but it, it needed that, unfortunately. It did, and I think it also deals with a lot of other questions we were getting around that point. Yeah. So I think I think that's that that's that's very good. And um, the next question is, um, can I show these talks to my twelve-year-old daughter? Um, yeah, I wouldn't see why not. Um, I mean, again, it's um, we need to give children. Uh, a bit more kudos in terms of their own ability to manage things a little bit uh, without being risky. Uh, but um, I, I'm, I think we need, ch children are, although they're growing up faster they're, and they're developing certain skills, there's a, an emotional maturity that's probably lacking a little bit. And I, I, and I do believe that to be important for us to kind of nurture that. So like showing someone a talk like this and walking through and trying to get them to see things through someone else's eyes or trying to understand the process around why I might go from one friendship to the next, to the next, to the next is utterly helpful. And when, once you're in therapy with a child and you point out that you know, the fact that you go into a group and say, I don't mind, I don't mind, I don't mind. And people then make it, and I'll give you an example, like the, the issue around three girls and they one wants to go to the beach and two wants to go to the cinema. But let's say that the girl who wants to go to the beach is very quiet and doesn't want to upset things. So she just goes, I, I don't mind wherever we go, wherever we go. So they end up going to the cinema and you can imagine this child sitting in the cinema feeling disenfranchised and that nobody listens to her and nobody hears her. But the fact is that she never said it. Do you know what I mean? And so it becomes a kind of a perpetuating cycle. And we need to be able to get children to be able to use their voices 
and believe in their voices because I've seen it so many times where a child goes from one relationship to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And we can see it in adults. And you can have, I, I know, uh, friends of mine who go from one disastrous relationship to the next, to the next, and you'd say, gosh, aren't they very unlucky? Well, no, they're not unlucky. They're except they're, they, they're almost permit, giving permission to be treated that way and they need to actually stand up. And, and, and that's harder than, uh, than it seems. But if we can intervene in childhood, we can really help someone not to develop into an adult who accepts maltreatment, if that makes sense. So maybe it's not about showing the child the talks. It might be watching the talks with the child and talking Absolutely. through some of the issues. Okay. Yeah. And again, it, it's about a narrative, it's about creating an emotional conversation. And remember what I was saying before, where language fails, behaviour take, take, takes over. So when the child can't they can't voice their feelings about how frustrated they are or how angry they are or how sad they are, or how anxious they are. They're going to lash out, hit out and avoid. And we need to pay more attention to developing emotional language for children. And it's really, really important that we try and do that. Um, and again, it, everything in, in what we're talking about is about balancing. It's about somewhere in the middle. And I, I, I think I'm, when you do four talks like this after a row, you kind of, you, kind of it clarifies for yourself some of the themes of the importance around that middleness and parenting is I think it's about balance it's about trying to give enough pressure and surmountable stress so that your child evolves and grows but not too much so that they become kind of disabled by it or overwhelmed by it and I think the more I think about this and the more I'm talking about it I think that's a trial and error process you know what I mean you'll only know where the line is when you cross it so you, when you overwhelm your child with a bit of demand, then you go, OK, well, I need to pull that back. Um, and again, we need to give ourselves a break about that. This is all trial and error. And we are like, I, and again, I would say to you, there's no such thing as the perfect parent. But there's also, again, the, parenting is an aspirational process. It's something we all strive for, but very rarely if nobody ever hits it. And again, that doesn't mean we stop striving for it. But um, we, we we need to give ourselves a break and show some self-compassion that at the moment and again with, with the disruption of childhoods in terms of being away for lockdown and everything else children are going to struggle socially they're they are struggling socially they're struggling to find their way back into groups and they're trying to find their social savvy in a time where they're sanitizing their hands and wearing masks and there's so much anxiety around all the time and um, they just need more scaffolding around that and as parents we're still trying to find our way around this. And I just think, give yourself a break. You can't get it right all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, how do you help your child through the transition to secondary school and best friends moving into new groups and dropping your child, not replying to text calls, etc.? cetera? The, the first one is about weaning. So it is about trying to prepare your child for that significant gear change between primary school and secondary school. And it is massive. And again, I, I really think that uh, there's a suggestion that first year should be the new TY. And I, I would nearly kind of subscribe to that from the point of view of we, and especially somebody, a child who comes from a very kind of, maybe a rural school, small classes into this massive move. And if you can imagine, like you're sent in from, you know, had Miss Delaney for the year and she has, giving you golden stars and your 10 out of 10s and all that sort of stuff. And then you're into this big, massive environment where your school bag weighs heavier than you. And there's guys walking around with beards at, at their lockers and you have to find your way around to nine teachers and get to know them and everything. It's a massive, massive issue. So what I'm saying to you is start to build up their their organizational savvy in around fifth or sixth class. So getting their gym bag ready or getting their books ready or start. And, you know, one of the things I would say, and it's an alarm bell that goes off for me, when a, when a parent is talking about a teenage child and they refer to it as we, I always get a little bit of a balk around that. Like, so we do our homework and you're saying, that child's 16, he needs to be doing his homework by himself. And again, and, and oftentimes where we over scaffold a child, we can hide difficulties. Do you know what I mean? Where, uh, say for example a child with attention problems but if, if mum is kind of in first and second and third year organizing his bag and everything else for him and um, he's not learning how to do that himself and I think from the point of view some of it is stepping back and I would say to you you know parenting is is a weird role because the job is to become redundant when you're no longer needed you've done your job right in some respects so it's an unusual process that that's what you're trying to do so we need to be able to encourage children to be more able Getting to the second point, a child who's dropped by their friends is really difficult. And I, I, 
I don't, and there's a grief and a loss in it. And many times it's unexplained and it's, as I said to you, it's arbitrary. It doesn't come from anything that they've done. Um, but in that process, it is about nurturing their own self value. And what you really want a child is to kind of take a kind of their loss point of view. And I'll use the example again, two girls standing at their lockers in first year and they're Mary and Anne and their friend Sophie walks past and they say, hi, Sophie, and Sophie ignores them. And Mary goes, oh my God, what have I done? Why does Sophie not like me? And spends the next nine hours ruminating over what she might have done. And Anne says kind of, you know, screw you, Sophie, or whatever the case may be, and gets on with her day. The difference between Mary and Anne is a good sense of self. I know I did nothing wrong. She must have something going on with her. And it's almost like a good sense of self is not not being empathetic, but it's not being overly or hyperly sensitive to everything being your fault. And it is about through those experiences of, of people letting you down, you really want to come out of that with it. That's their loss view. And it is really difficult because it hurts. But sit with your child through the disappointment and allow them to survive it as opposed to trying to bypass the disappointment. And again, I think our involvement in our child's friendships, we need to kind of step back from that as they get a little bit older, because, you know, it is and I use this example all the time. My my daughter is saying, oh, a friend took my marker and she won't give it back to me. And my child is like eight. And my instinct was, I'll be in there tomorrow and I'll get it for you. I'll get the teacher too. And I said, actually, no, you need to kind of try and manage this first yourself. So see if you can go and ask. And, and, to, and it was much more important that she learned how to do that. And I was anxious. So I was, when she came out of school, I was like, did you get a marker? And she said, yes, I did. And I was like, great, that's fantastic. But from the point of view of it is, it's almost, it is again about that pacing the, and weaning off at a pace that they can manage. And if you pull back too quickly and realize that they're not able to do it, then step in again and, and allow them to do that. But again, that process of allowing them to be themselves will allow them to become themselves. And it is a really important process. And I would say we all are falling foul to the league tables, the external variables and the prizes. And I, I see so many teenagers who have really good self-confidence but absolutely their self-belief and self-worth is is in tatters and from the point of view that's really something we need to really address as as parents and schools and communities and start you know get let's give some medals for the kindest kid or the kid who came through adversity or the child who showed a great deal of spirit or the child who put out the, the chairs every morning or something like that rather than the fastest runner the brightest kid or the best speller and i, I think and again that's not about everyone wins and everyone gets a prize. It's just about seeing the human individual as a little bit more holistic than a performing child, if that makes sense. It does. We might try and keep the the answers a little sorry, short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got nearly 100 questions here. Sorry, I'm sorry, going to go through them all, but we've got quite a few of them. Um, just that we've got a number of questions that are kind of coming through with the same theme about a parent feeling that they haven't got great self-worth themselves and how what this may impact their children or how could they prevent this from impacting their child's development of self-worth? Yeah, again, uh, we are the blueprint and the template, so we have to really watch that. Um, if you're around somebody who's saying, I'm useless at that, I'd never be able to do that, I wouldn't be able to do that, that, that children do pick up that that is an atmosphere, that that becomes the culture. Um, and again, it's, it isn't about outcome, it's about effort. It's about, I try, I show up, I give it a shot. And again, it's it, it, you're trying to say, I just want you to show up. I just want you to try and I, I and I'm going to try. And if you are someone who struggles with that, make it a team thing. So I'm going to try and do something that I'm fearful of or something that I would find challenging. And I want you to do it with me or you do something and I will do something the same. Um, but we do need to be very, very careful just around the narrative around children because they're sponges and they do pick up a little bit on that. So again, someone who's very weight conscious is saying I can't diet or I can't do this or I'm no good at this. I should be walking. I should be this and I should be that. Um, we just have to protect children a little bit and, and mind them from that and just be conscious that they do take it in. Um, but work on yourselves with your child. Sorry. Okay. No, okay. Thank you. How to support, uh, how do we support our child who struggles with friendships due to ADHD and a developmental delay that leaves him out of step with his peers when not at school or at organised activity, he just sits at home all the time. How do we support him at home? Yeah, again, I think that the cost of ADHD in terms of self-belief and self-worth is, is significant from the point of view of 
the, these children who who get oftentimes tagged as the na naughty child or the bold child or the child who's not won't listen or whatever the case would be. And it's not a case of them being unwilling to do it. It's oftentimes a case of them being unable to do it. Um, and I, I think by owning it a little bit within your friendships and teaching him to say, like, sometimes I'll blurt things out and sometimes I won't be able to take a turn and sometimes I'll do that. But I'm trying and I'm trying to manage that. I'm trying to rather than. And again, it's about children are very understanding. They don't necessarily have the same kind of biases that we would have as adults. So when you describe to someone that you have a, a, a need or a deficit, the child doesn't make as, the same judgment as we do as adults. They just say, oh, well, that's that's what you do or that's something you struggle with. Um, and, and again, we need to give children the kudos to be able to manage that. And, and I'd be encouraging him to own it a little bit. Um, and I, again, if people see that he's trying, uh, there'll be a lot more understanding of the difficulties that he might make. Um, and yeah, and I think owning it a little bit, but the self-worth and self-esteem, you need to be, this child needs to be hearing somewhere that they're of value and they're good um, because a lot of the white noise that children with ADHD see is sitting outside of class, getting in trouble and, and feeling not very good at things. And so, yeah, we, uh, we need to, again, hold the rules and sanction, but nour nourish at the same time. OK, thank you. Any advice on younger children, four to five year olds playing with older children, eight to nine, eight to nine year olds under minimal supervision outside? Yeah, again, um, the the age of the child determines their ability, not the age of their peers. Um, so just because you hang around with older children doesn't mean you're older. Um, I think, again, four or five. I don't know whether they would have the, the social new noose to be able to kind of work around traffic and work around things like that or work around safety and things like that that an eight-year-old might be able to do so um, as much as they might want to spend time with the, the older children they may need to not do it and, I, and again and I, I'd say it's really interesting that we kind of and I, I'm sorry I'm going on about this but th there's something about recognizing the difference of ages sometimes we have siblings who are like six eight and ten and we treat them all the same that shouldn't be the case. I mean, there should be staggered bedtime. There should be staggered kind of autonomy and power, but literally akin to their developmental stage, not overwhelming them. And um, for me, four to five is still too young to be that unsupervised. That would be my view. OK, I might come to the last two questions then and then we might start talking about your podcast. So um, just the first one of the last two, would you recommend separating a child from another child who's having a very negative effect on their own self-worth or would you try and support them to remain in the relationship and manage it? Uh, depends on the cost to the child. And again, I mentioned the kind of dominant passive relationships and they're common. Um, but if you... Uh, no flower ever grew in the shadow of a tree and so from the point of view of it, if the child is not being able to use their voice and this child is domineering them or, or making a choice some sort of children are just not able to stand up to that uh, and they may not be able to stand up to it for a period of time so yeah i mean if, if if you can find other friendships that dilute the intensity of that it would be better than trying to just sever that relationship because you're kind of saying I, I don't think you can manage this friendship by separating it and um, but you don't want to leave them in a situation where they're being upset either and um, so again it's diluting it with other friendships and other relationships and encourage them to be within a tribe that values them okay and just then the final question how would you explain to a seven-year-old what a healthy friendship looks like just to end on an easy one Carmen. Uh, okay, that's easy yeah um, <laughs> Again, it's it's about how would you like to be treated by someone else? That's how you base your friendship. So if you wouldn't be mean to somebody, then you shouldn't accept that someone else is mean to you. Um, and it's a, it is about, you know, if, if putting yourself in their shoes. And I, I, I can remember, always remember, you know, when I was doing nursing, uh, the guy said to me, treat everyone like they're your brother, sister, or mom, or dad. And, you know, it did, it does, it, it, it hits home. Uh, and if they are coming back with tales of being mistreated, you'd ask them, well, would they, is that OK? Do you know what I mean? And, and try and get them to understand it and see it. But uh, the currency of popularity is very alluring for children. They And I, I said to you, children want to be popular children. They don't want to be popular adults. And so from the point of view, sometimes our ideals are not going to be, they're not going to fit with how they see the world, if that makes sense. OK, thanks very much. 
So I just want to talk to you about the podcast that you've you've started up today. And I suppose I particularly want to talk about it because we've talked about it a little bit between us. And one of the things that, that struck me as to why I wanted to talk to you about it at the end of these sessions was there's a lot of parents who um, have been asking questions over the last four weeks and we haven't even been close to get to the end of those questions. And I think we've talked a little bit about where those parents go with that. And um, I think this podcast could be some part of where they could go with some of the questions that they may still have that are unresolved. So I just might um, ask you a few questions in a way then that you can talk to the parents about what this podcast um, in sure. involves. So, so maybe first of all, what, what is the podcast called? Uh, it's called Asking for a Parent. Uh, it's a play on the asking for a friend thing. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that was the, the thing that I came up with first. <laughs> the content <laughs> followed. But um, yeah, um, no, uh, yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah, so yeah. Okay. I'm get to my long Great. answers again. Yeah. <laughs> and why did you decide to do it? Because I, in the last two months, Anya, my phone has never been busier. My email inbox is jammed with questions. There. I've never seen so many people struggling at the moment as they are now. And and it was kind of when we talked about doing this series, it was like, you know, I know I need to get it as, to as many people as possible to try and help them through this because I can't do this on a one to one. There is just the demand is too high. And um, I don't know whether it's lockdown two, whether it's fatigue, whether it's um, everything about our mental fitness is not available to us. But um, people are just really, really struggling at the moment. And uh, I just wanted to get to as many people as possible um, and the podcast seemed, it seems to be, I, I was very new to podcasting, I didn't know anything about it, I thought it would be simple, it actually turned out not to be, but um, yeah, that, that was that was the reason was to try and get to as many people as possible. Okay, and just continuing on that theme, it was very new to you, but it'll probably be very new to maybe a lot of people who are listening in tonight. So mm. what what is a po podcast and what do your podcast episodes consist of? What well, the, you the, I, I wanted to get the reach, so I wanted people to, to kind of be able to access it or to be able to promote it. Um, so what I've done is I've done eight episodes with some well-known Irish figures that you, you'll all know about their parenting issues. And I, I thought, you know, sometimes we look at people on TV and think they must have it sorted, but they're actually all struggling with the same stuff as we are. And, and I just got some really candid, honest interviews with people who were struggling through lockdown one and continue to struggle. So people like Ray Ronan, uh, Alison Curtis, uh, uh, Laura Woods, uh, Karen Coster is the one on, on that was released today. So that'll be the first. So there'll be one episode which will be an interview with them, and everything that comes up in the themes of that. Then we have a listeners' questions episode. So I'm going to record that on Friday. So whatever questions I get in between now and Friday, I'm going to try and and theme them and answer and give them kind of the long-winded answers that. <laughs> have bugbeared you for, for the last four weeks but in terms of that it's it's not on a clock so it allows you to it's about 40 minutes each episode um and yeah it kind of deals with younger children middle-aged children into teenagers and, and there's a wide range of difficulties from uh kind of fairly acute difficulties around eating disorder or anything like that people have questions around that or the child who's just anxious and won't kind of is, is anxious about COVID and sanitizing their hands. It's not completely about COVID, but just as a matter of, a, of popularity, a lot of the questions are. So people can ask questions and then I'll try and answer them over the eight hour, or the eight episodes between okay. now and Christmas, yeah. Okay, so if effectively the first, the first week you've talked to Karen and next week you'll be answering some of the questions that have come in based on that talk. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and that'll continue on then over the weeks. And I actually listened to the one today um, and it's very easy to listen to, I have to say, if people are uh, if, if people are kind of thinking, oh God, that sounds a lot, 40 minutes listening. Um, it actually is very easy listening to when I was listening to today. And I think what makes it so easy is the fact that you're talking with a parent who is, is engaging with all these real life difficulties as have uh, you as a parent and you're mm -hmm. sharing some of those difficulties and it, and it, it does make an awful lot of sense. Um, so who are your guests? You're saying that you, you've got... Uh, Okay. So uh, it's Karen Coster, and then I've Alison Curtis, uh, Sarah Carey, uh, Shea Byrne. I have a guy called Shane Smith who might, people might not know, but he's about 10,000 Twitter followers. And he's a, a senior coach of Kilmacud Croaks. He's a primary school teacher and a father of three. And he has some wonderful insights into the sporting culture. And I think dads would be really interested in that one. Um, and who else do I have? Uh, Laura Woods from Ireland AM and... 
gosh, if I've forgotten someone, I apologize. But there's eight, uh, basically. And then the eight episodes of listeners' questions, which are the important ones. So they're not the important ones. They're the ones that people can, can email in and I'll get to as many questions as I can. And, and there was a lot of questions actually this evening um, from mothers. I don't know whether they were all from mothers, but mm. some from mothers as well about the sporting issue yeah. and, and the importance in terms of socialisation in sport. So, that, so that's that's if people weren't able to get their questions through tonight, it'll be a place where they can go with them. Um, how is this podcast different to other parenting podcasts that are available? I think some of the parenting advice is not to be critical. It can be sometimes be not very real world and it can be sometimes a little bit, um, there's a lot of labor in it. Um, I, I've tried to kind of take a no nonsense approach and trying to, uh, and like, I never come to these things saying, look, I have it all sorted. I don't, I struggle all the time with, you know, being a parent, I find it, uh, and I, I just think there's too much parental guilt out there at the moment. I think people need to hear uh, some advice that give, that's compassionate to the role and, and, and takes into account that we have stress and we have things going on and sometimes we don't get it right and that's actually not that that's okay um, and and so I'm trying I'm trying to to offer people a little bit of compassion in a time that's really really difficult. Okay, um, and and podcasting as as you're kind of uh, alluding to there is a lot more labour intensive than it seems to the listener. Will it be worth the effort? Uh, I, I I hope so. I mean again. Uh, financially, there's nothing in it. I mean, it's not that's not the reason for doing it. Um, but it is. It's all about the reach. And if I can get the reach, and if if anyone's listening, if you can leave this talk tonight and subscribe to the, the, the you'll get the updates of all the episodes and everything else. Um, for me, if it gets out there and people are using it, uh, then it will be worthwhile for sure. Uh, but when this is the first time I've ever done anything on my own, you know, when you go to RT or you go to TV3 or whatever, it's all there for you. And if it, nobody watches, it's not really that big a deal but uh, my own self-esteem and self-worth is riding on this a little bit so um yeah it is it's, it's it's nervous i'm nervous about it because it's the first time i've kind of done it on my own i guess yeah okay and just just you're saying that there's, there's no money in it for you is the podcast free for parents yeah yeah it's free okay. yeah yeah okay. and there's no paywalls or anything else it's absolutely it's just go into itunes spotify i uh, all the tune in all those kind of podcasts thing, and it's all free it's all there yeah yeah. Okay. And uh, do you do, do you plan to do another po podcast series or is this just a once off? That's probably an unfair question to ask you right at the beginning of it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the plan is yes. I mean, I, I want to do uh, after Christmas, I want to do asking for a friend, which is advice to young people um, and address them. And, and again, um, just kind of trying to, to mass produce therapy in some respects to try and see if I can get some skill sets out there for young people who are anxious or struggling or talk them through panic attacks or talk them through things. Um, again, the difficulty is making something adolescent or child relevant when you're in your 40s and look like a dinosaur to them. But um, uh, that's, that's the bit I've got to work on. I've just got to make it make it irrelevant. Uh, and I'm going to do my best to try and do that over the next while. Yeah. OK, and just, just finally on that mass producing therapy bit, you did write a book before. Are you planning on writing any more? Yeah, uh, I, I plug that. Uh, it's called Cop On, which is kind of the socially savvy child. But um, yeah, if people get still available. But uh, yeah, no, I'm going. I'm, I'm writing a second book, which is about negotiating children's sport, um, and it's uh, hopefully we'll be looking at it. Well, the COVID, we don't know, but um, yeah, it's it's about trying to how do we encourage participation and keep children involved in activity um, without the drive to elitism, uh, and how do we manage that? Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, hopefully that's given everybody a good idea of what the podcast entails. Carmen, I can't say thank you enough for spending the last four Sat Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, where am I? <laughs> last four Wednesday evenings with us. It really has been a pleasure. Um, for parents there, we are hoping to do further webinar series. Um, we're certainly hoping to do um, some webinars around um, parenting children with special education needs, um, but we we will be looking at doing further webinar series um, in the future, and hopefully, you know, this this term coming up as well. Um, we will be sharing information about Carmen's um, podcast, so don't feel if you haven't got all the information down now that um, that you that you won't be able to find it. Carmen has sent on some information to us, and we'll be sending that around and putting it up on our social media. So just thank you everybody for joining us for the last four weeks. Thank you, Carmen, again, and um, hopefully we'll be seeing you soon. And I'm sure ourselves and Carmen will be working together soon in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Bye bye.